suggested that our work hovers around architecture like flies around a ship. Mm -hmm. I was annoyed at first by that, but then I thought we came out on the better side of that analogy, actually. <laughs> We're not architects, and we don't want to be architects. But as the title of this lecture suggests, some of the work we make sticks on, sits in, hovers around, and is about architecture. And since this lecture is uh, sponsored by the Architectural League, I figure I'll focus on tonight on our so-called architectural projects. Of course, all of our work is on, in, around, or about a lot of things. And that's the weird thing about a design practice. We engage in a more or less aimless activity. Our clients come and go, projects fall into our lap or are ripped out of our hands without rhyme or reason. One day we're packaging architectural theory, the next day shaving cream, making both newspapers and wallpaper. So saying this work is architectural is any more architectural than any of our other work is somewhat arbitrary. Is an on-screen design for a television station architectural? Is a book a kind of architecture? To us, it doesn't matter what our work is about, but rather we're interested in how it's about it. And so tonight I'm going to show a kind of pastiche of projects. Some are finished, some modest successes, some spectacular failures. Uh, the collages, animations, drawings, bits and pieces. And I'm afraid that it's somewhat unlovely, but I think that you can take it. It's a kind of work in progress. And I think it also reveals a conflicted uh, position we have in relationship to beauty. Beauty for us has always been a kind of byproduct to the work, not necessarily a goal. And it never comes so easily to us. And we're always somewhat jealous of the designers who, for whom it seems so effortless. So the, the last part of the talk then is, is goes from in the beginning, these print projects about architecture and that were implementing architectural ideas to projects which now are on, in, and around architecture. And um, the first is uh, a, a project we did in collaboration with OMA for um, a now well known building at the Illinois Institute of Technology. And as I'm sure everyone knows, that's the campus famously designed by Macy Vanborough. And uh, just as a little bit of background, um, the campus below the gray line is the Van der Rohe campus. Above the line, the gray line is the dormitories, and then the gray area was the area where the elevated train runs down State Street. And so, because of the sound of the train, that's basically an uninhabited space. And uh, when Oma won the competition, Graham chose the site underneath the train track as the site for the new campus center as a way for the building to connect the two parts of campus again. And because the students over the years had worn these paths into the ground underneath the train track, that became the plan of the building, so the building has this very um, intense uh, angular plan. And the only way to make that possible is that the building is this huge soundproof tunnel that goes over the roof of it, and then it's a city block size building underneath it. So the, the building is this kind of huge muffler, and the train comes along, it's really loud, and suddenly it disappears, and it, it runs over the roof of the building, and the building kind of squeezes up underneath it. And so our problem was that we started this project at the competition level, and then we started to think, okay, well, how does design, graphic design, figure into the building? And Rem's call to us was that if, if the building is a one-story building, basically the walls don't hold up the roof, they're held up by a series of columns. So the walls are purely symbolic, and so let's cover the walls every time that we need the walls to mean something. And so it's essentially a sheetrock, series of sheetrock boxes that are covered in different ways to signify different things in the space. So we started to think about, well, what, how do we, what do we do in a space like that? What should we do? And so we teach at Yale, and so we went back to this kind of very famous academic campus, uh, academic Gothic campus, and we're looking at this architecture. And one of the things that's interesting there is that in this very serious architecture, there's all these kind of funny jokes that are built in. So here over the law school door, the professor speaking to the sleeping students, or in the library, the student smoking a cigarette, drinking a beer with a naked girl on the wall. And so it's sort of like, in this very formal looking architecture, there's a real lightness to um, the, the iconography. And so, since it's a modern building, it's a Mies built, it's a Mies campus, in the student center, we started to build this, our own iconography with the idea that you have a, a 
the, the generic student, the generic student that does things, and then increasing that to a set of 300 different activities, and then a whole bunch of activities that the administration banned, but still we kind of find in the, uh, in the space itself. So it's sort of like that, that in this kind of uh, very complex surface, there's always something to find. And um, so then as you move through the space, you get these at all different scales. And so on the south entrance, you have this 20 foot high icon, which we call the international symbol of togetherness. Or on the west campus, um, a 20 foot high portrait of Mies van der Rohe um, on, the, on the sliding glass doors. And so um, you enter through his mouth, so basically the doors open up here and swallow by the piece. Um, and, <laughs> and then um, inside, you can see through to the, all the kind of the great founders of the university. Um, they're uh, fruited into glass. And I should also mention that um, you can see the ceiling is bare sheetrock. And the approach we took jointly to value engineering was that every time a material got cut out, we just left it out. And so it was just like, if we couldn't afford it, we just had nothing. And so the parts of the building that aren't covered are the, the parts of the building that are revealed in a kind of a Mesian uh, tribute to its materiality. And so um, uh, these, these big founders are butt up right against this raw sheetrock wall. And then as you approach the wall, you see that the founders are actually made up of all those little guys. So it's kind of the solution between the big reading and the short, the close reading. So these little students make up these uh, monstrous heads. And then, um, then the space is just filled with all these different kind of moments in it where um, the surfaces are either these really uh, lurid, transparent glass in these different colors, uh, or highly reflective surfaces. Um, uh, sometimes these very rough surfaces, in which case we just like, make typography by just sort of sticking things into the, the outside of the building, or so creating these really rough patterns onto it. Um, there's parts that are covered by curtains, and these are by petroblades, but we developed together a, a pattern where we took Mises' original campus drawings, the plan drawings, and then blew the trees back up to full scale, so you can just put big scale trees onto the, um, on the curtain. And then there's, they're stitched with this beautiful stitching that allows the light to come through with these very little lines. And then, again, the icons happen at different scales. Um, the building itself has this levels of transparency to it, so you can see the curtains are gathered in the uh, columns, and then you see into these really limited, uh, these lurid walls. And, um, and they're covered with this uh, lenticular wallpaper, so they kind of move. It has this kind of jiggly quality, kind of nausea-inducing um, space. And um, uh, some places here we use um, the sound uh, reflective acoustic tiles to make this huge happy face. Um, that has this kind of very dimensional quality to it. Uh, some places where special wallpapers are made, like flock wallpaper with figures again, where they're kind of matched to a pattern and they all share heads. <laughs> we also designed the light fixtures for the ballroom. So these the light fixtures that are made out of just these uh, crude conduit and raw uh, uh, fluorescent tubes that are bolted to the sheetrock. Uh, some places that the, where the, where the sheetrock is exposed, we also use the joint compound as a typographic medium. Uh, we made clocks that are embedded into the plastic wall, so a nine foot high digital clock that uh, at the back of the, the ping pong room. And then some places um, they ask specifically for pictures of students on campus, and um, so we derive all these images from the surveillance cameras. So you have these kind of like virtual <coughs> students doing sort of strange acts that kind of wrap this wallpaper into the space. And then just some things that are just for um, the sake of themselves, so this long light box along the ceiling with these really bright colors um, that reflect in the glass. Uh, this is Petra's hanging garden in the middle of the cafe. And then even just like, all the doors uh, have these kind of very rough door numbering that are uh, raised off the surface. Um, the figures get burnt sometimes into the plywood, et cetera. So it's a kind of every surface fondled in some way, uh, and then when they're not fondled, uh, a bare sheet rock counterpoint. Um, I want to end tonight just with um, a kind of, I, I always, and try to end the diagram. And, um, <laughs> you know, in, in doing a lecture like this, we're always kind of taking stock of where we are. And Rosalie mentioned this on the National Design Award, and all those things that kind of always make you kind of wonder what you're doing exactly or how it ties into where you started. And I think this is the diagram that, that is inevitable for design studios, architecture studios, maybe even like graphic design studios, where over time there's this kind of gradual. Uh, increase in your experience, the scale of your projects, and in a way the scale of your ambition that changes who you are and what you do. And then simultaneously kind of crash of uh, creativity exuberance. <laughs> so you, know, you start off and you have so much of that and so it kind of drains out of you over time. And so the, I think the challenge for 
in a studio is always somehow to overcome that, and it's always sort of like, that's the, the end. <laughs>